Welcome back to Pinpoint History, everyone. When last we were together, we ended on quite the low note for the Romans. Valens was now dead in a field somewhere, along with two-thirds of his army. The Goths, having scored a major military victory against the Romans, still did not find themselves in a better situation after having defeated Valens' force. While the Goths could bask in the glory of victory, and even killing an emperor, the main problem they faced had still not changed. Namely, they had no lands to settle in, no supplies, and the major cities were still defended by their walls and they could not break in. Back in the west, Gratian's court was horrified by the news that came from the east. Speaking of which, Gratian's rule in the west had been less stressful than his uncle's from the period of 375 to 378. Following Valentinian's death in 375, Gratian had managed to rule effectively, dealing with the border skirmishes that occurred and with the one major Alamanni invasion in 377, which caused him to turn his army back around when on his way to help deal with the Gothic problem. Valens' death sparked a potential crisis moment. The eastern half of the empire was now leaderless. Gratian, now only 19 years old, had demonstrated some skill in previous campaigns. But with the West divided between him and his brother, a potential usurpation was possible. Unlike Valentinian, who had left behind two heirs, Valens had no heirs at the time of his death. Gratian was forced to appoint a co-ruler in the East who would be loyal and not attempt to have him or his brother killed and assume complete control of the Empire. The Roman Empire can get very Game of Thrones very quickly, as we'll see soon enough. So in 379, Gratian appointed his Eastern counterpart, a man named Theodosius. If you recall from the first episode, there was a man named Count Theodosius who was Valentinian's go-to problem solver when things got real out of hand in Britain and Africa. Our new emperor is that man's son. Theodosius was born in 347 in the province of Hispania. His father, who we have talked about, was a famous general, and Theodosius also embarked on his military career. Theodosius did well in the army, eventually being granted a command of Moesia, one of the border provinces along the Danube. When the Quadi coalition invaded Roman territory during the reign of Valentinian, Theodosius was able to repel the invading forces in his district. Afterwards, when Valentinian dropped dead from his tantrum of epic proportions, court intrigue saw Theodosius stripped of his command and sent back to the estates in Spain and his father executed. And court intrigue strikes again. And those who moved against the Theodosians had their fall from grace, and Gratian was able to reinstate Theodosius back into the military. Likely from the beginning, and I'm just riffing here, Gratian had never wanted to remove either Theodosius Jr. from command and Theodosius Sr. from life. Still, the intrigue was rampant, and Gratian is a young ruler, only 16 at his accession into full emperorship. He lacked his father's stature with the army and the political apparatus. Gratian's decisions were probably minimal. Back to the present in 379, Theodosius is co-elevated to Augustus, and immediately he sets about trying to solve the Gothic problem. Theodosius's most significant problem was his lack of manpower. If you recall the last episode, two-thirds of the eastern army died in the fields near Adrianople. Theodosius was forced to levy new recruits, and by levy, I mean conscription. Life in the military in the 4th century was not pleasant. Desertion was punishable by death, fighting the scary barbarians was a death sentence, so the new soldiers really enjoyed their time in service. Nostalgic for the days back in the 2nd century, when he spent her days building fortifications and sneaking out of the barracks to the local towns to start a family. Increased recruitment from the auxiliaries and even Gothic deserters filled the ranks. Despite the increase in manpower Theodosius was able to gain, the quality of the soldiers was decidedly lacking. In the latter half of 379, Theodosius took his new force to fight some engagements. They fared decently well against a small group of Goths. However, in 380, against a larger group, the Romans faced a decisive loss in the field. The Romans were able to make an orderly withdrawal to lick their wounds, 
and the contingent of non-Roman soldiers were scapegoated for the loss. Things took a turn for the worse in 380 when Theodosius became what many thought was deathly ill. However, he managed to recover and finally took residence in Constantinople afterwards. In 381, Theodosius knew that he would not be able to defeat the Goths decisively militarily. That ship had sailed with the death of Valens and his army. Theodosius' moment to end the conflict came when a minor Gothic leader pledged his submission to him. Theodosius graciously accepted his submission and lavished many luxuries on him. However, the Gothic leader died the same month he pledged submission, and I promise there was no foul play by the Romans this time, just an old man dying. Theodosius used this death to his advantage and gave the senior leader a lavish state funeral. This allowed Theodosius to begin negotiations with the more prominent Gothic leadership still lurking about in the Balkans with this gesture. Now here we have a watershed moment in the history of the Roman Empire. The Goths were given land to live on. Still, while groups would be broken up and dispersed across the empire in the past, they were allowed to coalesce in one spot, and even more dramatically, they were allowed to keep their leadership. The Goths essentially had their own nation within the bounds of the empire, and they would defend their land on behalf of the empire, but under their own leadership. This is a clear indication of the empire weakening, and this was due to many factors of mismanagement by the Romans themselves. Now you're thinking to yourself, wow, I sure am glad this calamity is over. The empire surely will chill out now. Not precisely. Remember when I said the empire can get a bit like Game of Thrones? Well, it's about to get very turbulent now. In 383, a general in Britain named Magnus Maximus revolted against Gratian. Also quickly, Magnus Maximus, through my shoddy Latin interpretation, translates as Great Greatest. So, that's a little funny to me. However, what he did next was not funny. Leading his troops over the English Channel and into Gaul, modern-day France, Switzerland, Belgium, Northern Italy, he met Gratian's forces. Gratian began by losing the exchanges, and he began to retreat, but was captured and executed. The apparent reason for the revolt against Gratian was that he was favoring his personal unit of Alans, a group of Iranian speakers who migrated westward due to the Hunnic expansions. I am a bit skeptical because 30 years prior, roughly, an emperor named Constans, the youngest son of Constantine the Great, was dethroned in the exact manner for favoring his own personal bodyguard of barbarians over the regular army. I digress, however. In 383, Gratian was killed. He was 24 years old and ruled the empire since he was 16 years old. Theodosius in the east was unable to provide much assistance due to his own military impotence and the fact that he had to be very wary of his eastern border with the Sassanids. Maximus began to push onwards towards Italy, but was faced with a large force that had come from Italy under a general loyal to Valentinian II, who was 12 years old. This left Maximus at an impasse. He could not break into Italy, and unwilling to move east against Theodosius, the empire settled into an uneasy truce with Theodosius in the east, Valentinian II left with only Italy, and Magnus in charge of Spain, Gaul, Africa, and Britain. The status quo remained this way for four years until 387. Magnus' rule as emperor was not seen as very legitimate by the courts in Constantinople or in Milan. Military might is an effective means of legitimizing rulers, however, and Magnus had plenty of victories from his time in Britain. By 387, Theodosius was able to maintain a peace treaty with the Sassanids. This altered the balance of power that had allowed for the uneasy status quo. Maximus, aware of Theodosius' peace with the Sassanids, decided to make the first move. Maximus invaded Italy, pushing through the Alps and towards Milan, the imperial capital of Valentinian II. Valentinian II now found himself in a very precarious position. Now that Maximus had invaded Italy, if Valentinian II was captured, he'd likely be executed as his brother Gratian had been. 
His only choice was to seek refuge in Theodosius' court, which could be just as dangerous. Theodosius had been appointed emperor by Gratian, but Gratian was dead now, and Theodosius was a successful military commander and emperor. By placing himself in Theodosius' grasp, he could also be in grave danger, as removing Valentinian II and defeating Maximus would give Theodosius sole command of the entire empire. Caught between two difficult decisions, Valentinian II made the choice to flee to Theodosius. Valentinian II, his mother Justina, and his sister Gala, and the rest of their entourage came with them to Thessalonica, a city in northern Greece where Theodosius came to meet them. Valentinian II was able to cement blood ties between him and Theodosius by offering his sister in marriage to Theodosius. Theodosius accepted the request, and I'm sure Gala was super pumped to be used as an imperial bargaining chip. But what can you do, I guess? With all the arrangements in place, in 388, Theodosius set off towards the west with his army to liberate the western provinces for his co-emperor and now brother-in-law. The resulting civil war was brief. Theodosius was able to engage Maximus' forces at the Battle of Save in modern Croatia. Theodosius was able to push Maximus' forces back, and they retreated to Aquileia, one of the most heavily fortified cities in northern Italy. Theodosius pressed on and sieged the city, which did not last long. The garrison of the city surrendered and brought Maximus to Theodosius in chains. Maximus begged for his life, but Theodosius had him executed regardless. I'm not advocating murder, but you have to know what the results are going to be when you lose a civil war. And Maximus certainly had no qualms about having Gratian killed when he began his civil war. After the execution of Maximus, Theodosius' general, Arbogast, who we will be hearing more about shortly, found Maximus' eldest son and co-emperor and had him executed in well. So in 388, our imperial situation looked like this. Theodosius, emperor in the east, and Valentinian II as emperor in the west. Except it didn't reflect the reality of the new situation. Theodosius remained in Italy for another two and a half years, reorganizing the political apparatus with people of his own choosing. Valentinian in 388 was 17 years old, old enough to rule in his own right, as his brother Gratian had done only at 16. Unlike Gratian, Valentinian II had been coddled his entire life, staying in the palace in Milan, being raised by his mother. Gratian, while not being born in the purple, had come into imperial power as a young child. Furthermore, his father had been able to take him on campaigns, introducing Gratian to soldiering and commanding. Valentinian II had found himself in a bad position. The fears he had before going to Theodosius' court began coming true. In 391, Theodosius finally left Milan for Constantinople, but before he departed, he left his general Arbogast in charge of the armies of the West. And here's a fun little side story as well. So in a tale as old as time, a famous charioteer in the city of Thessalonica had been arrested for sexual assault. This charioteer was very popular, and the charioteer-loving citizens began clamoring for his release wearing free charioteer t-shirts. Eventually, the crowd of people became less of a peaceful protest and more of a riotous clamor. The rioters overwhelmed the garrison of the city, and they were killed. When news reached Theodosius of Milan, he got a little worked up and had the rioters killed. When Theodosius slept on it, he probably realized that wholesale slaughter was the way to handle this, so he sent a second order cancelling the first one. Yet, it was too late. The first order reached the new garrison of Thessalonica, and when people gathered in the Hippodrome next to watch the races, the gates were locked and the people were killed. Over 7,000 citizens died. This is a bit of a black mark on his record, I would say, you know, slaughtering your citizens, not really the move, but, you know, is what it is, I guess. Theodosius would be forced to do a public penance by the Bishop of Milan, 
But that's for another time. Going back to our narrative. Arbogast, for all intents and purposes, was the emperor in the West. Valentinian II became a puppet emperor, not even residing in Milan, but in Vienne in Gaul. All the high-ranking official positions in Milan had been filled by Theodosius, and the army was run by Arbogast. Sources indicate that Arbogast was highly antagonistic towards Valentinian II. So much so, that Valentinian wrote to Theodosius and the Bishop of Milan to be baptized. At this time in early Christianity, many noble figures would be baptized before death as a way to cleanse themselves of sin they incurred during life. Valentinian asking to be baptized indicates to me, at least, that he was fearful for his life. The final straw between Valentinian II and Arbogast came in 392, when the young emperor wished to lead the armies against an incursion of barbarians like his father, brother, and uncle all had done. Arbogast did not allow Valentinian II to do so, and in response, Valentinian II dismissed Arbogast from his position. It was here that Valentinian II most likely realized how weak his position really was. Arbogast is said to have responded, You have neither given me my command, nor will you be able to take it away. And soon after this encounter, on May 15th, Valentinian II was found dead in his personal chambers, his cause of death being labeled a suicide by hanging. The last male ruler of the House of Valentinian was now dead. Now, the death of Valentinian II has been debated greatly. Some claim it was a suicide, and Valentinian II, realizing the depths of his impotence, killed himself. Valentinian II was 21 years old and had been a puppet emperor since he was 4 years old. Others believe it to be the work of Arbogast, quietly removing the young, troublesome emperor who no longer wanted to be the team mascot. I personally lean towards Valentinian II committing suicide for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Arbogast, as a Frank, was viewed as a barbarian and could never claim the emperorship for himself. Secondly, Arbogast was able to claim de facto power for himself through the young Augustus. Killing Valentinian II removed Arbogast from his power source. Lastly, what comes next in our narrative seals it for me. Are you ready, kids? Because guess what time it is. If you said Civil War, give yourself a clap on the back, because that is what we're getting. Our second Civil War only in four years. Because the only thing more destabilizing than emperors dying in battle, or killing themselves, allegedly, is our depleted sources of soldiers killing one another, leaving the Empire's frontiers nice and exposed. And when the soldiers do get back to the grueling lifestyle of repelling incursions year after year, it becomes even funner with less people to do it with. So buckle up, and here we go. After the death of Valentinian II, there was an interregnum of four months, which means there was no emperor in the West during that time. After four months, Arbogast had a man named Eugenius appointed as the Western emperor, which makes that how many emperors since our first episode? Let's count them. In a span of 29 years, from 363 to 392, we have had Julian, Jovian, a Valentinian, Valens, Gratian, Valentinian II, Theodosius, Magnus Maximus, and now Eugenius. That, folks, is nine emperors, of which only three die a non-violent death. Jovian, Valentinian, and Theodosius. And I realize I may be giving away the plot a little bit here with sliding Theodosius in there, but this guy lived 1,626 years ago, so you can't really claim spoilers. Point is, being emperor can be bad for your health. Anyways, with Eugenius becoming the Western Augustus, delegations had been sent to Constantinople to Theodosius to recognize his new imperial colleague. Two delegations had been sent to Theodosius, who never gave a straightforward answer for or against Eugenius. While waiting for Theodosius' response, Eugenius and Arbogast engaged in some purging of their own, replacing people in the civil services with people of his own choosing. Arbogast obviously still remained in charge of the armies. 
Finally, Theodosius made his opinion known to the empire. In January of 393, Theodosius had his younger son Honorius acclaimed emperor, with his eldest son Arcadius already being an emperor prior to. The message was clear. Theodosius intended to make his son co-emperors, one in the east and one in the west. Both sides began to prepare for war. To me, Theodosius' silence from May of 392 until 393 indicates that Theodosius was not involved in the death of Valentinian II. Certainly, Valentinian II's death opened the way for his youngest son to be declared emperor. But this silence also indicates to me that Theodosius was carefully weighing his options. With Eugenius declared emperor in the west, Theodosius had to decide whether or not to support him. He could allow for it to happen, but the accession of a fully grown man into the emperorship would mean Theodosius would not be able to bully the other man into doing what he wanted. Theodosius also had to consider whether militarily he was capable of doing so. The Roman armies now had been filled with what we call Fodorati. The Fodorati were barbarian troops that had settled on Roman lands and allowed to keep the tribal structures in place, like the agreements the Goths had come to with Theodosius. In the West, a similar agreement had come under 40 years or so under Julian with the Franks, another group of Germanic peoples. This group of people would end up producing Charlemagne. Some consider him to be the first Holy Roman Emperor, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. The armies of Rome are commanded by Roman emperors, but their ranks are primarily filled by barbarian troops, which is not a good sign of things to come. The two sides of the empire needed time to build up their armies and train them, so it wasn't until 394 that the two forces met each other for battle. The Battle of the Frigidus was another bloody affair that the Romans could ill afford. The Frigidus, located in Italy, so the Theodosius' forces had marched from the east to Italy. This battle is also known for the final battle of religions in the Roman Empire. I have avoided thus far getting steeped in matters of theology so far, but there have been many esoteric religious issues occurring over this period I have discussed. Down the line, I'll cover Roman religion from the old pantheon to the conversion of Christianity. What is important in this moment is that Eugenius and Arbogast use icons of Jupiter and Hercules, while Theodosius was a devout Christian. The battle began on September 5th, 394, and Theodosius began with a head-on assault against his enemies. If the initial charge was done by the Gothic forces under Theodosius, and they took major casualties in this battle. Over 10,000 Goths would lay dead on the field at the conclusion of this war. Half of their fighting force died that day, with an estimated 20,000 Goths fighting under Theodosius. Despite this furious assault, the head-on attack gained little in the way of advantage, and at the end of the first day, Theodosius had been unable to push Eugenius and Arbogast's force from their positions. Not only had Theodosius been unsuccessful, but Arbogast had been able to place troops behind Theodosius' forces. Those forces blocked Theodosius from retreating through the mountain passes. His army now fully down on their luck and blocked from retreating, the day ended. Theodosius began fervently praying in his tent that night, looking for some kind of divine aid, and someone must have been listening that night. Two huge events helped turn the battle for Theodosius. First, it was the troops that had been sent to block his retreating path that turned to his side. And secondly, and this is a big one, an event known as the Bora happened. I hope you'll excuse my dumbed-down version of what the Bora is, but essentially, it's high-pressure winds that blow in a northeast direction. Apparently, this is a common occurrence in the Adriatic region. The next day, the winds began blowing at high intensities, whipping up dust, blowing in the faces of Eugenius and Arbogast's force, and apparently even turning arrows shot towards Theodosius's forces back at them. Eventually, Theodosius's army was able to push forward, and Arbogast's forces, unable to fight back due to the Bora, began to break rank and flee. 
Eugenius was captured and brought before Theodosius. Once again, another emperor pleaded for his life in front of Theodosius, but to no avail, he was beheaded. It seems like Theodosius has definitely read his Machiavelli. Arbogast was able to escape, but committed suicide shortly after the defeat. On September 6th, 394, Theodosius stood alone, master of the Roman world, the first emperor of a united Roman realm since Julian over 31 years ago. And he died in January 395, only four months later of edema. He was 48 years old, and he was the last ever Roman emperor to rule over a unified empire. So let's try and break down what's happened in the prior episodes. Julian died in 363, which sparked the beginning of our story. We met Jovian briefly, and he brought us to Valentinian and Valence. For 11 years, we saw a stable empire in the joint reign of Valentinian and Valence until Valentinian died in 375 of chronic anger. We found ourselves in a precarious position, but still manageable, with Valens in charge and Gratian now in power. But we saw that all it takes is some terrible mismanagement and a thirst for glory, and we have an emperor dead and two-thirds of the army with him. It's only after Valens' death do we see it all start to come unraveling at the seams. Theodosius was unable to truly do anything about the Gothic problem, and he was forced to diplomatically deal with the situation. Not that diplomatically handling the situation was a bad approach, and probably the better approach originally. What it does indicate is weakness. It cannot be understated that the loss of the soldiers at Adrianople crippled the eastern half of the Empire's army. Two civil wars did not help either sapping away much-needed strength from East and West militarily. After Gratian's death, the politicking between Theodosius and Maximus began. Valentinian II was a non-entity. The generals knew it would come down to the two of them exerting control over the young emperor. After Maximus was unceremoniously dispatched, Theodosius did just that. He was ruler in the East, and by other means he held sway in the West through Arbogast. Valentinian II couldn't just be killed, but he could be controlled, and his death, whether by murder or suicide, changed the balance of power. In the end, Theodosius took his chance to become Emperor of the East and West and divide the empire between his two sons. What Theodosius could not have known was first, his death was just around the corner, and that his two sons would be dominated by generals and court officials just like Valentinian II had been. Upon the death of Theodosius, his eldest son Arcadius at this point was 17 years old. He was Augustus in the east, while his younger brother Honorius, who was 10, became Augustus in the west. The two brothers spent their reigns being politically impotent, being figurehead rulers while powerful generals ruled through them. Continual issues in the west occurred with Honorius being exploited by different factions to gain power. Theodosius' treatments of the Goths during the Battle of the Frigidus would also bear bitter fruit as well. The new king of the Vithagoths, a man named Alaric, had fought at the Battle of the Frigidus and became king a year after the battle. Alaric would seek formal recognition from the East and West as an official Roman general, but was denied. Eventually in 410, Alaric would sack the city of Rome, a major event in the history of the empire, and the first time since 390 BC, roughly 800 years ago. The West would also lose control of Britain at this point, as forces from the island had been recalled to Italy during Alaric's time. Roman Britain would be forced to fend for itself from the Saxon invaders. The West would continually find itself bogged down from invasions and suffer greatly through the Hunnic menace. Attila the Hun would make life in the Western Empire miserable, and he would intimidate the East as well. The East would not find itself in such a troublesome position as its Western counterpart. While militarily inactive, the East did not have to contend with as many invasions as the West did from countless Germanic groups bordering the West. Arcadius would die in 408, and a son, who was seven years old, 
named Theodosius, became emperor. The early part of his reign is notable because his eldest sister, Pulcheria, in 414, who was 15 years old, became the dominant figure at court, influencing her younger brother until he became of age. Another fun factoid is the Praetorian prefect at the time, Anthemius, began the construction of the Theodosian land walls, a set of triple land walls that would protect Constantinople until 1453, when they were finally breached by the biggest cannon ever made at that point in history. The eastern half of the empire had always been the lucrative portion of the empire. When the separation of the two halves, especially now with the two courts, tax revenue was able to build up in the east, while the continual invasions in the west began to slowly dry up the western coffers. The east would be able to slowly regain its strength, and the separation of the two halves of the empire would eventually lead to the decline of the west. With its power waning, they would slowly lose their lands to encroaching forces, but the Visigoths and Franks in Gaul, the Vandals in Africa, and the Suevi in Spain. And with Rome retreating from Britain in the early 5th century, the Western Empire shrank down to the Italian peninsula. An emperor in the late 450s named Majorian would attempt to reclaim the lost provinces in the West, and would reclaim Gaul and Spain, but was murdered in 461 by competing interests. Eventually, the last Western emperor would be deposed in 476. The eastern half of the empire would go on for another 1,000 years, or more accurately, another 977 years. The eastern half of the empire would attempt a reconquest in the 530s and would regain Africa and Italy and even parts of Spain, but the holds on Spain would be nominal and Italy would be fractured but they would maintain some sort of hold in Italy until 1071. Africa would be lost in the 8th century as well, during the Arab expansions. I chose Adrianople as the moment the snowball began rolling down the hill. Adrianople was not the sole reason for decline of the empire, but to me it shows when the empire was no longer able to effectively throw its weight around. There are countless factors and moments that led to the end of the West. Adrianople is just one of the bigger reasons. The Western Empire could have held on longer had it been able to maintain competent emperors on the throne. But the emperors became increasingly weak, manipulated through court intrigue and strongman generals. Eventually, the Western armies would not only be filled by Germanic troops, but even led by Germanic generals. The outsourcing of the army to non-Roman soldiers and generals increased the divide between the interests of the state and the interests of the generals. The events at Adrianople began to accelerate the process of non-Romans in the armies of the empire, and the continued dependence was just one of the many large reasons the Western Empire collapsed. Well, I hope you enjoyed this series on Adrianople. If you liked it, please give it a rating wherever you're listening to the podcast and follow me on pinpoint underscore history on Instagram to get the latest scoop on the podcast and for historical memes. I'll be taking the next week off to prepare for the next series I'll be tackling. And once I'm back, I'll be doing my best to commit to a weekly Sunday release. I'll see you all very soon and let's get it.